for one final fight, the Payday Gang as we know them ride out to war. There are powerful allies across the massive state of Texas that would be worth having if things went to hell in the capital. Oil barons and weapon smugglers that could offer protective and financial support in a post qatari world. And with how much they were offering, there was no way the gang could just ignore Locke's contact, even if it was at the 11th hour of their fight against the dentist. The world was going to hell, but staking a claim in the Lone Star State was always worth it, for whatever came next. For the last time, with this gang and this generation, this is the story of Payday. Final preparations were in place for Duke to guide the Core 4 to the Qatari secrets found at the base of the White House. So despite being on the initial roster for one final job out in Texas, he gave way for the four-member Texas Heat Squad to assemble. Heading north from Bullock's Mansion in Mexico, Sangres and Clover met up with Bonnie, traveling from San Francisco in the west after her team's fight with the Triad. Finally, they were joined by Jiro, flying out from the Washington safe house, wanting desperately to move on from the loss of his son, another victim of the dentist. This was possibly the most experienced gang faction they could assemble outside of sending Dallas and his crew, so whatever resistance the Midland Ranch, located deep within the Texas Midlands, had to offer, it was already in the path of an unstoppable force. Whilst it was Blaine Keegan, a Texan native who had initially contacted Lot behind the scenes for his assistance in gaining a stranglehold on the Texas region, it was his right-hand woman, the arms dealer Gemma McShay, who'd act as the gang's handler, supplier and intelligence for this first job at the ranch. Blaine was, after all, a family man, looking to go on the straight and narrow, but not before leaving his criminal legacy for Gemma to inherit, and that legacy needed to be uncontested by the unknown upstarts fresh to the region. Gemma herself was an experienced runner and smuggler, so much so she was able to get her hands on the kind of tools of warfare that modern battlegrounds would deem inhumane. Lightweight snipers that could be carried alongside another powerful heavy weapon, and the Basilisk 3V grenade launcher equipped with Viper grenade technology, a chemical weapon capable of innumerable war crimes in record time. Supplying the gang was a show of good faith that also left them incredibly well armed for a fight at the ranch, and that's exactly how things went down. Midland was a closed-off Texan ranch, with no animals in sight, instead acting as a remote base of operations for gunsmiths to craft illegal military weapon prototypes to be sold to the highest bidder, in or out of the country. Despite its rural setting, this was a finely tuned machine that had gone from legitimate cattle ranch overnight after the boss of this operation had turned up pointing guns at the ranch hands, demanding to know what they could offer this new leadership. From a private conversation overheard by the gang whilst casing the joint, many of the ex-ranch hands were also skilled gunsmiths, who had been coerced to pump out weapon after weapon to outcompete and leave their competitor in the gun-running market, Gemma McShay, superfluous to requirements. The man doing the coercing was one Esteban Santiago, a weapons dealer with violent tendencies, whose only redeeming quality was his ability to steam a good ham. While suitable muscle, McShay was of the opinion that Esteban was taking orders from someone far higher up the criminal food chain which was confirmed to be the case once again when those loose-lipped civilians confirmed that Esteban was working for a corporate overlord, referenced only as her. From what the gang were able to ascertain, this was the woman who'd prompted Esteban to directly start a turf war with McShay and had delivered the blueprints for the prototype weapons they were building. This wasn't enough to go off though, so the gang sought out Esteban himself, who once again made reference to a lady in a suit who was getting nervous due to the exposure of the operation. Apparently, some US Marshals were already digging into their dealings, meaning to avoid the planned raid, the runners were shutting down the rancher's operations within the day. This was warning enough to the Payday Gang that now was the time to strike, immediately masking up and violently dealing with Esteban to avoid any loose ends or reprisal. In the process of going loud, the crew hit the Central Ranch headquarters, forcing their way into Esteban's office to make good on the lead they were given regarding this mysterious unnamed benefactor running the operation from afar. Unsurprisingly, given their operations around the suspicious ranch, the police were not far from a call, meaning the Texan force had a chance to immediately get acquainted with the Payday Gang for the first time. Uniquely, they brought along Texan marshals, senior ranking officers who carried powerful sniper rifles and preferred combat from a safe distance. Fortunately, this crew with their new arsenal were more than prepared to face down new unit types and tactics, making short work of a hack on Esteban's laptop in the central ranch before proceeding to pull down the gate into the weapon crafting area. Quickly, they set about securing the crafted weapons within a Fulton cage to be airlifted to safety. 
Esteban's strange tendency to keep golf carts on his ranch for transportation also came in handy here, giving the crew a method to rapidly transport loot from place to place. With all the spare weapon parts, they were even able to scrape together some extra loot before it was pulled to the heavens. And after the bombs were completely raided, all they needed to do was set up the workstations with C4 to send a powerful message to whoever was in charge. McShay wasn't to be messed with, and Midland Ranch was out of commission until further notice, quickly fleeing back to the river for an escape into the Texan wilderness without being trailed. The Texas crew wouldn't be laying low for long though. With McShay's closest and most aggressive rival already in the dirt, her mind turned to opportunity outside of the gun running business and the power vacuum that was now opening up. A hit on a high value military convoy stationed at an industrial rail terminal somewhere in Fort Worth. This was an opportunity for the Payday Gang to truly prove their unassailable strength to those in the region, as well as their dependability to their allies. In many ways, this was a challenge set by McShay and her boss Keegan to test this crew, with the US military of course being the custodians of the trained convoy. This was a hit on the best and most unforgiving in the region, at a time where the military structure of the US was in disarray following Murky Water's infiltration, and absolutely brutal methods of suppression were not out of the question. Now was not the time for mistakes. In any case, the loot they were going after was a series of money printing plates, akin to what they'd taken before the initial heat street hit. Heading from Fort Worth to numerous locations in the US, all within different shell company containers. Evidently, the idea was to hide the true nature of this operation, but that was hardly enough to stop the crew from giving this one a shot, as those plates had virtually infinite value to a buyer with the right resources to make use of them. But to make things even harder, the US military had already placed road blockades for miles around, meaning getting out via conventional means was no longer an option. This wasn't going to be a good old fashioned train robbery, the Payday Gang would literally be stealing the train. Silently entering the compound with a little guile and acrobatics, the initial checkpoint was well guarded, meaning the ground crew had to find a way to open the gate from the inside. Amusingly, letting Locke work his magic via misplaced walkie talkie was enough to gull them this time, allowing a safe and silent entrance to the compound. The fear of military backlash and rumors of a new high-tech shield unit were enough to keep the gang out of sight, slipping directly into a well-guarded warehouse to silently gain intel on the locations of the printing plates. In the process, they overheard a couple of train yard workers discussing a potential new career at Sarah, an oil company taking the region by storm and surely opposition to McShay and Keegan's new foray into the industry. Clearly, their influence was growing fast, but oil was not the focal point of today's heist. Back on track, the terminal inside gave away which company was acting as the decoy, allowing them to locate their primary objective. This intuition was proven by the high-tech motion sensors that prevented their immediate entrance. This was a type of security the gang had never encountered before, tied to a keygen panel mechanism across the station. Enough of an obstacle to inadvertently set off the alarm and send things to loud. With that, their attempt to drive the train out silently fell to pieces, but this was simply pushing the operation towards a far flashier plan B. First, forcing the gang to blow a set of pipes with C4 to block the tracks of the loot-carrying trains, preventing them from just driving off. Grabbing a blowtorch, the gang got to work on the disguised carriages, hacking bolt access via an RFID override, and securing the plates in train C33, one that had been brought out of rotation and moved to the secondary tracks just for this moment. Sadly though, setting off the alarm would also shut down the turntable mechanism, meaning they couldn't proceed via conventional means. Instead, Locke's insane plan to airlift it across to the open tracks that the army had yet to blockade came into practice, attaching the hucks of a nearby heavy-duty crane to do the lifting. As the multi-ton machine was hoisted through the air, the army was scrambling to block the escape, calling in their new shield marshal unit, who came equipped with a special riot control shield and drum mag-loaded shotgun for when things got nasty. This new challenge provided the gang with something to think about, but posed no realistic threat, with half the heist already behind them. Holding out at the crane control station until the loaded train was finally in place to depart, kick-starting the engine and escaping aboard the train before the SWATs were in position to intercept, clearing one of the most politically daring heists of their entire career. By all accounts, whilst this was another major embarrassment for the military, the Colos Crane Company really appreciated the publicity they received for seamlessly handling the loaded train under serious time pressure. After a heist with as much media attention as this one though, the gang were forced out of Fort Worth whilst they awaited further contact from their Texan handlers. Eventually, they received the call they were waiting for, but this one came directly from the top. Gemma McShay remained a valuable contact for the dealing and fencing of weapons, but from here on in, the crew would be doing business directly with the big boss. Equal parts business and con man, Blaine Keegan. He was increasingly desperate to expand his influence on the Texan oil trade, but had already lost one refinery earlier this year to a mysterious and environmentally costly disaster. 
he suspected sabotage, so his suggested heist was all about corporate espionage in reprisal, involving one of the most deserving targets the Payday Gang had ever set eyes upon. Sustainable Energy and Research Applications the oil company hiding behind an environmental buzzword-filled title, better known as Sarah, who was wrangling a large chunk of the Texan oil market via every dirty trick in the book. The firm's CEO and founder, Alice Rainey's business model was to put petroleum at the forefront of energy again, but promote the use of a carbon capture solution instead of renewable sources of energy. However, based on how she'd approached her rival with Keegan already, this was all for show, and she didn't care about anything other than her bottom line. Even better for the gang, after analyzing the stolen data from Midland Ranch, Alice Rainey, Sarah's founder and CEO, was the very same woman setting up illegal gun smuggling operations back in Midland. She was as corrupt as it comes, and even worse, she'd already taken a shot at Keegan via her lapdog Esteban's aggression towards his right hand, Gemma McShay. This was license to ruin, with Keegan getting in touch directly to send the coordinates of the penultimate heist, moving the gang from their safe house just outside of Fort Worth all the way to the iconic city of Dallas, to the headquarters of Sarah, which also housed their primary research and development facility. This mission was four-pronged. Find irrefutable blackmail to ruin Rainey's reputation, destroy the R&D lab to remove any evidence of Sarah's environmental research, steal their state-of-the-art carbon capture prototype, the Neo-2, apparently named that due to rhyming with CO2, and procure a solid chunk of Sarah's scientist research documents to understand and replicate their technology in-house for Keegan's firm. This might sound like robbing one bad guy to feed another, because that's exactly what it is. But it's easy to forget, with all the recent saving the world endeavors, the Payday Gang are money-hungry killers at their core, and Keegan seemingly paid better than Rainey. Heading into the facility, it was a maze of business officers towering above a subterranean laboratory with modern corporate niceties and grassy verges to give off the illusion of being a reputable and upstanding business. The timing of this heist was crucial. Sarah were that very evening intending to unveil the Neo 2 to the press, meaning the facility was far busier than usual and a few extra suits in the grounds were unlikely to go noticed. Their intel had told them that Tracy Coleman, the marketing director, and Albert Simmons, the chief scientific officer, would be in the area to address the press conference directly, meaning they had two easily manipulable targets with whom they could open up doors on this heist. They took Tracy first, the very picture of a drug fueled hyperactive marketer, a charlatan with more energy than talent, who, when faced with a gun barrel atop the stage where they planned to showcase in the O2, was more than willing to open up the container immediately. This device was better known as a zeolite membrane electromagnetic polymer filter, and could revolutionize the oil industry by reducing its atmospheric imprint, giving the owner of the tech the upper hand in the ever-important virtue signaling war for government grants. You can see why Keegan would want it. Next, they went after Simmons, the CSO, as he headed over to meet with Tracy to discuss his role in the presentation. Whilst not a good or particularly brave man, he was at least a real scientist, but also one more than willing to hand over his RFID tag to grant the gang access to his team's research documents. That was two steps down, but to really send a message and deal the kind of damage Keegan wanted to the lab, a loud approach would be in order. Revving up to charge the headquarters, the gang split up to quickly secure the blackmailing evidence, finding an incriminating email to Alice Rainey's accountant detailing Sarah's continued bribery of the Environmental Protection Agency. A recording in her office of a conversation with an arsonist, one Jacques Brunier, who had been, as Keegan suspected, tasked with sabotaging his tankers with little concern for the environment or human impact of their rivalry. And finally, a recording from the answering machines of the chief of security at Sarah, one Gabriel Santiago, seemingly the brother of the recently deceased Esteban, out for revenge, implicating Rainey in the Midland operation beyond any doubt. Solid evidence of malpractice to go public with. That left just one final objective. Of course, the gang had to procure some C4 plant in advance to flood the underground lab and leave it beyond repair for the company, arming the explosives on the great glass tanks, lining the lab and blasting through, flooding the entire area and leaving it as one huge electrical hazard, sprinting over to the escape chopper, which was already in position to fly the gang out of Dallas before the military could assemble even more firepower. This left the crew with one final objective, destroy Alice Rainey personally beyond any hope of recovery. Within a day of the hostile takeover at their research headquarters, the police and media were all over Rainey and her corrupt dealings at the company. The arson, the bribery, the smuggling operation. It was all laid bare by the gang and featured on the 9 o'clock news. She'd reportedly fled offshore to avoid the media glare and gain some leverage over the board, but Keegan had one last ace in the whole plan, a final gut punch to her and Sarah, targeting their primary offshore oil rig, which was already under lockdown after Rainey had reportedly fled there as a final bastion of protection to hide her funds from the feds. 
The procedures to remove her from Sarah's leadership altogether were in motion, so it was clear she couldn't hide behind the board of directors anymore. Keegan had intel to suggest she'd stationed her most loyal employees there to protect her and those last remaining dollars she'd stashed away in her private office. Gabriel Santiago was in charge of security operations, and had already called in the top personnel at the mercenary group, Bellmead International, to keep the rig safe from intruders and its workers inside as effective hostages to maintain a business-as-usual appearance to onlookers. Santiago was right to be paranoid after what had happened to his brother, as the gang were indeed planning a final heist to end the feud altogether in their boss's favor. A final all-out assault on the rig. The gang had prepared a boat to silently enter from below and zipline their way up to the lower decks. There was no intention to keep this one quiet for long though, as the overarching goal of this heist involved the kind of fireworks that can't be kept under wraps. Shooting on sight made the most sense given there wouldn't be an all rig around for much longer if things went to plan, but it seemed a SWAT team already stationed in the area also got the memo that it was time to go in for the arrest, as they arrived within a minute of the payday gang ending up intercepting their assault by chance. With Bellmead reinforcements arriving and the usual suspects of the old payday task force in attendance, this was not an easy gunfight given its hostile setting, forcing the gang to think on their feet whilst they pushed into the server room to destroy the servers and jury rig access to the oil processing area. After testing the oil sample, which related to the tanker with the highest oil purity level, the crew were ready to proceed to the elevated arena that was the oil processing station of the rig. Here, they committed possibly the most brazen crime in history, directly in front of the police, actively attaching a pump to the oil tank and siphoning it to a nearby tanker ship, effectively ripping millions of dollars worth of fuel directly out of the bloodstream of the Sarah industrial machine. A complete display of callous disregard for law enforcement that could only be earned by over half a decade of successful heists. But if things went right in the capital, even a crime like this one could be forgiven. In any case, after our bloodbath on the rooftop, with Sarah's oil now on its way to line Keegan's barrels, the crew were able to proceed to the drilling tower to end things once and for all and reunite the Santiago brothers. Gabriel went down swinging, as Rainy had outfit him with an experimental murky water combat suit that was still in the prototype phase for their own fight against the Payday Gang. This made him virtually immune to all ballistic damage unless the suit was exposed to direct and extreme heat. Quick thinking, the crew poured oil over him and set it ablaze, leaving him wide open for a final killing blow. With the keycard he carried now in their possession, the gang rushed to the upper floors to disable the safety protocols on the rig's systems, before building pressure within the pipe. They also procured access to Rainey's personal retirement stash, completing the process of utterly dismantling all that she once was before she met them. Whether she was still stationed at the rig was uncertain at this point, they'd heard nothing of her across the tannoy since landing, but in any case, even if she somehow survived what came next, there'd be no recovering her business. The final step was to activate the oil drill, which, with the carefully controlled pressure in the rig's pipes, led to catastrophic but not instantaneous destruction of the refinery as parts began to overheat and explode, leaving the entire structure creaking. The gang simply had to escape before the rig went up in smoke entirely, racing their way back through to the offices and down the zipline once more, sliding to the rib and steaming their way outside of the blast radius, before the oil rig and all that was once Sarah Incorporated came crumbling down, at least for the foreseeable future. Most of the police responders were also caught in the blast, meaning the crew were free to fly back to shore uncontested, going back into hiding with an incredible paycheck and a well-earned loyal ally in the form of Blaine Keegan. For Bonnie, Jiro, Sangres, and Clover, this would be their final heist together under the moniker of the Payday Gang, at least for many years to come. The US was changed forever after the events of the White House a couple of days later, with Jiro and Sangres free to retire in peace to Japan, whilst Bonnie and Clover returned to Europe. But as of September 2023, with the rumors that the Payday Gang might just be back in action, who's to say there won't be need for them to heist together again, or for Blaine Keegan to come calling? The true allies of the Payday Gang will be more crucial to their survival than ever before, with no bane to hide behind. So, I hope you've been listening closely to the final story of Payday. A new heisting dawn is right around the corner, and you never know who we might see again. A huge thank you to my dedicated Patreon backers. If you want to join this crew in Going Infamous, check out the link below and pledge as little as $2 to see your name in the credits or get 24 hour early access to future videos and vote on upcoming content. Take care, I'll see you all soon.